Hi! About a year ago I made a video about long distance photography and I got a lot of comments on that one. And one question that was asked surprisingly often given that the video was about photography was uh, why does our atmosphere not get sucked into outer space? And it turns out that no matter the context that's actually a pretty good question uh, because it's not really all that easy to answer. Now the standard way to answer that would be to talk about gas dynamics, fluid dynamics, thermodynamics, and then talk about pressure differentials and entropy and what have you. But it turns out that that's really not all that helpful if the person who asked the question doesn't already know all of these concepts and isn't already familiar with all the physics that goes into it. So I figured I would try to answer the question from a first principles point of view by using a very simple simulation that hopefully shows all the effects that you want to see and then gives a very simple answer to this particular question. So let's have a look. The simulation is very simple. It only has three rules. Rule one, atoms fly through empty space unimpededly. There's no friction or air resistance because the atoms are the air. There's no other medium. There's no attraction or repulsion between atoms. Atoms do not affect each other at all unless, rule two, when atoms bump into each other or into the walls of the container, they bounce off according to conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. In other words, atoms bounce like idealized billiard balls. Rule 3. Atoms fall down. If one goes up, it comes back down. In detail, there's a constant downward acceleration, and that means that atoms don't fly in straight lines, but follow parabolic arcs. Just as in Rule 1, there's no interference from a medium, because there is no other medium besides the atoms themselves. And that's it. There are no other rules. About those red bars on the sides of the container. Those are pressure bars. They show how much pressure the atoms exert on the sides of the container. You can see that there's a small pressure spike every time an atom hits the side of the container, and the size of the spike is proportional to the horizontal velocity of the atom. This will become important later. For now, notice that the pressures are not at all uniform going up and down the sides. That's because pressure is a macroscopic or statistical property of a volume of gas, meaning the average of all interactions between a mind-bogglingly gargantuan number of individual atoms and the surface of a container. For example, right now in this room, this 1.25 liter water bottle contains this many gas molecules. The simulation, on the other hand, contains only 10 atoms, which is a somewhat smaller number. That means that there is a lot more variation in the statistical results because the sample size is so small. In order to get reasonable results, we have to increase the number of atoms. Like here. This simulation follows the same rules, but contains 35,000 atoms. It's now much harder to see or let alone follow individual atoms, but the statistics work out much better. Note how the pressure graphs show a lot less variance and indicate that the pressure gets slightly lower from the bottom towards the top of the container as expected. Also notice the empty space in the center. The big question I want to address is about vacuums and, if you recall, there are no special rules regarding vacuums in the simulation. So before continuing we should test whether the three simple rules we do have support realistic behavior of vacuums. The sphere has a small door on the bottom that I can open with a key press. When I open the door, notice how the vacuum inside the sphere sucks in the surrounding air exactly as expected. Notice how I said the vacuum sucks in the surrounding air, but that is just a figure of speech. Vacuum does not suck neither in this simulation nor in reality. What is actually happening is that the vacuum does not resist atoms randomly flying in from the outside because there is nothing there with which to resist. If, for some reason that will become important in a moment, the surrounding atoms were not being forced into the vacuum, the sphere would remain empty. In conclusion, the simulation appears to treat vacuums correctly. Now it's time to take the lid off the container and see what happens to its contents when they are exposed to outer space. Here's what that looks like. I created a much taller container, we'll see in a moment, and left the top open. While we're down here at the bottom, we can see that the atmosphere's pressure, again indicated by the red bars, drops off quickly as altitude increases in the exponential fashion predicted by gas dynamics. As we move up the air column, not only does the pressure drop to zero, but so does the density of the air, i.e. the number of atoms per volume. Towards the middle of the column there are only a few trailblazers, and in the upper third or so there is absolute vacuum. No atoms are coming even close to the top of the container, where they would disappear into outer space. Clearly, the simulated atmosphere is not being sucked away. I'm going to turn atom trails to make it clearer what's going on here. 
the air is so thin at the top of the column that any atoms that made it that far up are no longer pushed up by other atoms bumping into them from underneath, so their remaining vertical velocity bleeds off quickly, at which point they turn around and fall back down again. And that's really all there is to it. What goes up must come down. While the vacuum of outer space can offer no resistance to invading atoms, atoms in the atmosphere simply don't have the energy to travel that far up. In fairness, there might be the odd outlier atom that randomly picks up enough energy to reach escape velocity and disappear, but the probability of that is basically nil. We can keep watching for a little bit to see if anything bad happens. Basically there's nothing going on here. I'm just going to see if there's maybe a few outliers that come up fast, but the tallest atom right now, that up in the left corner there, is already turning around, bumping off the side, going back down. There's one that is going straight up in the bottom there, but it's already turning over. And right now there's really nothing going on. Let's see what's happening further down below, if there's any fast ones coming up, but I don't see any. Oh, there's actually a fast one coming up on the right there. Let's trace that one. There we go. Let's see how far that one makes it. But I don't think that's going to be super impressive. Let's have a look at the entire column to see uh, what that looks like. With the atom trails turned on, we can see what's going on. And that's the story. The vacuum of outer space doesn't suck away our atmosphere because A, vacuum doesn't suck, and B, the gas molecules in the upper atmosphere have basically zero chance of picking up enough kinetic energy to reach escape velocity, which is about 11 kilometers per second. So that's it. Um, now, while I still have you here, if I still have you, uh, let's have a look at a related phenomenon, namely buoyancy. Can our simple kinetic model maybe explain why some objects who have a lower density than the surrounding medium do not fall down like everything else does, but actually stay afloat or even rise in the medium? Here's another simulation with another empty sphere suspended in the middle of the gas volume. But this time the sphere can move freely. I assigned the sphere a mass such that its density matches the average density of the gas, which is why the sphere is suspended in the gas and neither falling nor rising. If you look closely, we can see that the sphere is indeed movable and is undergoing Brownian motion due to randomly being pushed by surrounding atoms. I can now reduce the sphere's mass by pressing a button and in response the sphere will rise towards the top of the container. Then I can press another button to increase the sphere's mass and it will sink towards the bottom of the container. Neither of these behaviors are programmed into the simulation, which still only follows the three simple rules I explained in the beginning. The buoyancy of the sphere is a direct result of the density and pressure gradient in the gas, which in turn follows from the three rules. There are more atoms pushing against the sphere and pushing harder from the bottom than there are atoms pushing against it from the top. The result is a net force differential pointing upwards. If that force differential is exactly matched by the sphere's weight, the sphere stays stationary. If the sphere's weight exceeds the force differential, the sphere drops. And if the sphere's weight is less than the force differential, the sphere rises. That was all. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.